So we're going to talk about how to do a horror scenario with the Sandy Peterson way. And we're going to open up, I'm going to give you some basic uh, rules on how I create horror scenarios. And then we're going to make one. Okay, all together. And, you, and, you, and I'll explain my thought process every step of the way so you will know, you'll see how I do it. Now, the first disclaimer is, um, this obviously is not the only way to make a horror scenario. It's not like making, designing and role-playing game scenarios is hardwired into the human DNA. So you may have some technique you want to use that fits your personality, but this is how I do it. Okay. So first, some basic rules. This is not Mr. James. This is M.R. James, Monty Rhodes. Any of you guys heard of him? Yeah. Excellent. So this is Lovecraft's favorite uh, ghost story writer, and he probably is the best ghost story writer um, that, that that around. He's really, really fabulous. And what he did, he was an English antiquarian, so he basically had the job that Lovecraft dreamed of having. And uh, every year at Christmas time, he would write a ghost story and then read it aloud to his friends. Because in England, for some reason, Christmas is the ghost story time. I, you know, it's like, I don't understand why, but that's when theirs is. So they read a ghost story, and so all the story, and after he did this for like 20 years, the friend says, you have 20 of these things, put them in a book. So he started putting them in books. You can get the complete collection of M.R. James' stories nowadays, which is wonderful, because when I was a kid, I couldn't, you know, and I was not able to get them, or just a bit of them. But the ghosts are, the ghosts are skinny and bony and hairy and malign and, uh, and just amazing uh, creatures. <clears throat> and they're all designed to be read aloud, because that's how he did them. So that's kind of cool, too. Um, so, M.R. James. And the reason I'm bringing him up is because... He, in one of, his, one of his essays, which he did very few of, well, he did a lot of essays, but they were about British antiquarian things, right? So they're like really dry. But about ghost stories, he wrote the three rules of writing an effective ghost story, and these rules apply to running a horror scenario as well, okay? So we're going to do the, for the first one. And of course, it, in our case, it probably won't be a ghost, because, I mean, while there's ghosts of a sort in Call of Cthulhu, it's not like Lovecraft really, really had a ghost, right? Um, it uh, is malign. None of the stuff about the ghost just wanting you to find his body or tell you where the treasure is. The ghost is bad. Now, it doesn't have to be bad that he wants to kill every single person in the world, but it has to be malign. Now, my example of this is, have you ever seen the George C. Scott movie, The Changeling? Which is really creepy and really good until you find out the ghost is good. And then it's like, it all turns to crap. Um, for me, at least. Okay, it doesn't make the first part bad, but it like kind of spoils it. I've never gone back and rewatched it because the ghost turns out to have a kind of a benign purpose, and that ruins it all. So the ghost has to be malign. Now, I won't I won't spend a lot of time on this because if you're playing Call of Cthulhu, that's like usually not a problem, <laughs> right? The monster being malign. Uh, occasionally, there's someone that wants to have the great race of Yith or someone be good. Um, so if you're one of those people, I urge you to reconsider. But uh, so first, it's malign. Second. Place it somewhere, the players, well, he didn't say players, but you know, can imagine themselves to be. So he would say, he is in places that were common for 1920s England, which is like seaside resorts and old libraries, that's where he hung out, right? But my example for this is, in fact, the movie Alien. Now, here is Alien, a fabulous horror movie set on a spaceship, which none of us will probably ever be on. I mean, cross our fingers and hope, but. Odds are slim. But the point is, Alien seems like a place you could be because the spaceship is like old and crappy and the guys are bitching about their pay and, and there, there's condensation in the, in the engine room. And you're like, man, if I was on a spaceship, there'd probably be one like this. You know, and it seems like a normal place. Now, if you set it on a Star Trek spaceship, okay, horror on Star Trek wouldn't work the same way because a Star Trek spaceship, obviously, we're never going to be in a spaceship like that where it's like all clean and the floors are plastic and everything's nice. But the alien spaceship, that's where we'd be, right? So, so a Star Trek horror doesn't work the same way as the alien horror. The alien horror is somewhere you command yourself to be. So one of the things that um, surprises some people is that uh, I always set 
uh, call, might call a Cthulhu scenario is one well, always, but quite often in the modern day, like today, not in the 1920s, because it's harder to imagine yourself in the 20s. Now, Lovecraft wasn't writing nostalgic stories in the 20s. He was writing cutting edge, and I really like the outfits back there. I know I'm, I'm kind of dissing on the on the 20s, but they're cool. Okay, um, uh, so Olaf was trying to write about the most up-to-date modern stuff. He has airplane exploration of the Antarctic. He has the discovery of Pluto. He has submarines. This is cutting-edge material for him. Okay, uh, I, I, a person was talking to me once. He said, "Well, Cthulhu can't be that tough if he got beat by a steamship." And I said, "Look, you don't understand. It's 1927. Okay, and." The most powerful mechanical thing available to humanity is a steamship. That's the biggest, most potent thing. And what Lovecraft is telling us is that the biggest thing we have can't beat Cthulhu. It just slows him down for about 30 seconds. Okay? If he'd written it in 1945, I guarantee a nuke would have gone off on him, which in fact Robert Bloch did in the book Strange Eons. He, they, they, they nuke Cthulhu. And of course, you know what happens is he reforms 10 minutes later, but now he's radioactive. You know, so uh, anyway, so put it somewhere where you can imagine themselves. Now, the reason that Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu was kind of baseline set in the 20s is because uh, back when I was doing it, Lovecraft was really obscure. Literally, everyone I knew who heard of Lovecraft had heard about him through my influence. I'd gotten them to read him. Okay? And uh, so, like, you know, uh, what happens is that Chaosium wanted to do a game about Lovecraft. And they thought Lovecraft was a terrible hack because that was the going uh, opinion of Lovecraft. Okay, they hadn't really read him. They just said he's a hack because everyone says he's a hack, right? And uh, but but they were they were smart enough to realize that because they thought he was a hack, they couldn't do justice to a Lovecraft game. They had to get a guy who was a dyed in the wool fan to write it. A lot of companies wouldn't be that smart. They would just do the job and like make fun of the of the topic. It's kind of like what happens in the third movie of a superhero franchise when you get the guy in that doesn't that thinks superheroes are for kids and screws it up. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so they got me to write the book, but then they also said we have to have something in the book that we can hang our hat on so we can enjoy writing the background material and stuff for it. So what they came up with was the 1920s. They said 1920s are cool, a little of that, and they got real. That's why there's the 20 source that they really got into the 20s, and then gradually now Warcraft today. I mean. Chaos and they love Lovecraft, and they learned to love, love him back in the day. But that was the original function of the 20s stuff, so that Chaos would be interested in that topic. Okay. Now, when I played it, I would often play it in the 20s, but I didn't have a lot of 20s stuff going on. I was, yeah, I take the streetcar here or whatever, but I was, I was just trying to do the horror underlying it. So if you can pull off the 20s and make that seem modern or horrifying, or bring out the part of the 20s or the 1890s or the 1650s, whatever you're doing, to make it seem like a real time and place to the players, that's what you're trying to do. So I actually do have a science fiction uh, scenario that I run that will probably be published in the next Peterson's Abominations, which takes place 500 years from now. But, but the players have told me it feels like today because the people are squabbling and some of them lied on the resume and, and uh, you know they, they don't really know how to repair the ship, but they just said they did. And of course, with modern computers, you can really pull it. Um, so, it's, so you can play, you don't have to place it like at your college campus or at your house, but make sure the players feel like they could be there. So they like so they're mentally in place. Okay, third. No jargon. Okay. Now, in, of course, what M. R. James was worried about was in the twenties. There was a lot of psychic stuff going on. The Order of the Golden Dawn, and so he didn't want people to talk about vibrations and past lives. And like, if you look at Lovecraft stories, uh, the Silver Key and Through the Gates of the Silver Key, these are like his least scary stories because they have the jargon. Okay. Now, in, in, in terms of a horror story or a horror scenario, what you're going to want to do is not pull in, you, you, you're going to use the rules because they help set up the situation to do things, but you're going to want not want to focus on the numbers so much. So, you're, so instead of saying, uh, like, the monster hits you, takes six damage, you're better off saying something like, its barbed tentacle lashes across your shoulder, takes six damage. You know, and then they feel that they're being hurt by the monster. Later on, you can have things happen. Well, climbing the ladder is harder because he got your shoulder. You know, or you can, or you can do things like instead of just saying "make a sanity roll," you can, you can describe it in a way, and then 
sanity roll is the second part of what you're saying, and they get it. They understand that it's scary, there's monsters, there's, so, so if you ride too much into the jargon, then they can lose some of the horror. So those are, the, those are some basics that M.R. James wrote that I have tried to do when I'm running the scenario. I also don't try to do, do things that I'm weak on. Um, one of the things I wish I could do what is, um, is accents. And I'm really not able to do that, so when I have a character, I can't like do the funny accent. Oh, one thing I also recommend, just as dinner for any horror thing, it's like never let two NPCs have a discussion. Because then the game master talking to himself and all the players have to do is wait until you're finished with the decision. So I would just skip to the chase and says, uh, your major D talks to the, the main guy and, and they say, yes, you can go in the kitchen instead of having the discussion, right? So that's just my rule. <coughs> It just seems indulgent to have uh, uh, NPCs talk to me. Um, sometimes there's things they have to know. Um, okay. So, any questions about uh, these? Yes. You mentioned M.R. James. Do you think Casting the Runes as a story was one of the more influential stories on Lovecraft, or just James in general? I don't know when Lovecraft first read M.R. James. But uh, obviously, he loves. I mean, he talks about casting the runes in his yeah. uh, in his so book, Supernatural yeah. Horror Literature. So he loves it. Casting the runes, by the way, is a fabulous, fabulous uh, um, story that I recommend. There is a film version of it, uh, two films versions Night of it, because the they made the movie uh, Night of the Demon, and they made it in, in England, and then they made it in America, and it's cut differently. Um, and and, and uh, artsy film directors complain because early, you're not really sure if there's a demon for a lot of the movie. And then there is, and, that, and I think it's fine there's a demon, because it's like kind of the point of the story is there is a demon. But it's really creepy the way he builds up on it. Let me give you some examples of it, because it's worth doing for scenarios. So at one point, so the guy is being trailed by the demon and doesn't know it yet. He like gets up to, to uh, he like, he's like, come downstairs at his hotel, and the guy says, I take your bag for your shirt. And he says, what, I don't have a bag? Well, I thought you had, to, had a big like, carpet bag or something. I guess you don't, okay. Then he's getting on the train, and the conductor says, no dog, sir. He says, I don't have a dog. He says, I could have sworn. Oh, I guess you don't. And this kept hap this keeps happening, right? And it gets closer and finally, right? Uh, uh, so that's the kind of thing that I've done, pulled on the players that had a guy say, no dogs. And he says, I don't have a dog. And have people see out of the corner of their eyes something that's not right. Very effective. Another Amber James uh, event that's really good. There's a story called The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. And in the story, they work out where this treasure has to be hidden. Abbot Thomas died hundreds of years ago. And so the guy goes down a well where it is. He finds the stone with seven eyes, and he moves it aside, and he reaches in, and there's a big leather pouch. So he reaches in and grabs it, and pulls it out, and it puts its arms around his neck. <laughs> you know, that's like, <laughs> like fade to black kind of thing. But uh, anyway, Amber James, all stories are short stories, um, and they're just, they're just fabulous stuff, so I recommend it. Uh, other questions before you move on from Amber James? Okay. When I say he's the greatest ghost story writer, I'm not saying he's the greatest horror writer, just the greatest ghost story writer. Because uh, I like Lovecraft, obviously. And um, in fact, I got an award in, uh, at the Necronomicon Society. Uh, I got, they had the, the Howie Awards, which they give to um, people for, I don't know exactly what, for greatness in promoting Lovecraft's knowledge. And Stuart Gordon got the first one. And I got the second one, and they said, the reason Lovecraft is known today, and I'm quoting them, so don't blame me, is because of Call of Cthulhu and Stuart Gordon's movies. And they figured both of those moved through geek and popular culture in two different directions and made Lovecraft popular. And the reason that I am able today wear Cthulhu socks is because I did Call of Cthulhu back in 1981. So, yay. All right, let's do a horror scenario together. And I work very visually in my head. That's how I see things. And as a result, a lot of my things come from scenes in books, which I picture in my head, or scenes in movies. So what we're going to start with is a scene from a movie. And uh, someone put up your hand. Okay. In the back. Yes. So think about some movies and things. So, for example, think about a scene like Frodo throws the ring into Mount Doom. Or, um, uh, or the, the moment in the telltale heart when the, when the main character hears the heart beating under the floor and thinks it's there. Or in 28 days later when he looks up and the drip hits his eye and he knows. 
or Romeo and Juliet. Just pick a scene, any scene from a book or movie or play or anything. Just pick a scene? Pick a scene. Book or movie. Oh, when they have to burn the Velveteen Rabbit because it has scarlet fever. Got it. Germs on it. Sure. Burning the rabbit. We'll remember the Velveteen part. Okay. Now, now, we like, we like that scene with the bird and the rabbit, and it's kind of cool that it happens off screen, and the guy's like, where's my rabbit? Where's it gone? Well, we had to destroy it. So we can, we can work this into our scenario somehow. Okay, so now we're going to pick a place. Okay, and the place could be Scotland, or it could be a lighthouse, or it could be on a zeppelin, or it could be on a space station, or in the sewers, or in my bedroom. Uh, not mine, but, you know, like yours. Um, or uh, uh, Maine, or the North Pole. So, someone put up your hand. Okay. Hot springs in the rain. Hot springs. Possibly Reykjavik. We'll see if we, we end up using that, but it could be there. Okay. Third. <clears throat> we're going to have an opponent. So, um, what we're going to do, we're going to pick something. And usually when I do this, I say, let's pick a monster. It doesn't have to be a monster. It could be a weird old one. It could be just a cultist. But let's pick, a, let's pick an opponent. Um, uh, when I was in Poland last time, the scene they picked was uh, a sword fight from the Three Musketeers on a Zeppelin and a Shoggoth. So don't pick a Shoggoth this time. Now someone put up your hands and pick a monster for me. Pick a monster. Um, an ancestor that's been dead for over 500 years. Undead ancestor. Okay. Now we're going to take these things, and this is pretty much how I do it. I, I, I get, the, I get, I, I find a scene I want to have somewhere in the scenario, and it could be the climactic moment, or it could be anywhere in it. Um, and so we're going to have that scene. I pick a place I want to have things happening, and I want to have an opponent. So let us think about an undead ancestor. An undead with hot springs is kind of an odd combination. So I'm going to kind of want to work with that for a little bit. Um, so let's do the scenario, and we've got to figure out what's it trying to do. But this is the part where I don't rely on you. Or I, well, we're trying to figure out what it's trying to do. The, pur the purpose of the bad guy. And what I like to do in my scenarios is I set up the opposition, and I have their plan and what they're trying to do, and I don't really plan out how the players are going to stop it. I figured that's up to them. My job is to give the puzzle, right? And one of the advantages that I found is that because I'm not worried about the player solving it or not, I mean, you know, it's okay if they solve it, but, but my focus is on the situation. But I can have my plan advancing and doing things as they're going through. They don't have to, they, they don't, I don't have to wait for the players to get to the next step. Like something could happen, they're like, ah! And they feel like it's a, like it's a real event, like this progress that, that if, they, if they slack off too much, it'll be bad, and that, of course, scares them. And that can adjust the rate of speed it happens. So that's like the purpose. So we have an undead ancestor. Um, we have um, our heroes. And so why are our guys going to the hot springs? It's our ancestors. It's our ancestor at the hot springs. So he must be... Um, we, we aren't just randomly there. If it was a different kind of monster, it could be we were just at the hot springs and there was a monster there. But if it's our ancestor, and I think it's, I think it's gotta be a player's ancestor. There's no other reason to have this be cool, right? So it's our ancestor, and he is getting us there somehow. Okay, so let's think how he's doing it. So, so uh, he's got a hot springs. Somewhere, sure. Why not Reykjavik? Well, we'll say Iceland, because Reykjavik is just like a city, and uh, we might want to be in the country, away from people. Um, and I'm going to say that the ancestor he's drawing some kind of power. From, you guys can chime in here. He's, draw, he's. I think the ancestor has people that are working with him that are somehow getting energy or magic or power out of these springs. Okay? Yes? People might be there because it's some kind of reunion. And the they could be there because of reunion. Um, but, but uh, they, so if we have a clan, we have like the clan. Um, Yeah, it would be Heidvig's clan, because uh, uh, my favorite Iceland woman is uh, Helga Heidvig, Heidvig's daughter. Um, so we're going to have, the, 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 and, and one of the issues with Icelandic people is that they don't, like, you don't have the same last name as your dad. 
or is your granddad because it keeps changing. So it's harder to have that clan thing connection. But, so you know what that means? That means most of the clan members that know that they're Heidvigsons are people that went to America and then the last name stopped changing every generation. So, what if it's an accidental happenstance? So like maybe some American. Well, then it can't be your, your ancestor. It's just too weird, right? Well, it could still be. So, is it possible that the ancestor was trying to wake up something that was sleeping beneath the hot springs and died? It could. It, it could. But I'm thinking the ancestor might be the thing that's there. And I'm thinking that what the ancestor needs is to. Um, could it be feeding on feelings of malice? It could be. I kind of like a more, a more direct or brutal thing. But let's, let's start with the point of that, of that. He's got people. There's people that work at the place. Okay? Possibly not related to the ancestor. Yes? He may have drowned either accidentally or on purpose. I think he's a Lovecraft thing. I don't think he's a malign ghost. I think he's there physically. Because what I see in my head is a, is a rotten body dripping with boiling steam rising from the hot springs to do something, okay? And what I'm thinking he has to do is that <coughs> the hot springs are giving him power and there's something in the hot springs that gives the power, some magical something. Maybe it's closer to the middle of the earth. Maybe it's Gobo Gig and the furnace of the gods, right? Down underneath there. It doesn't have to play into the scenario. It's just there. And when the players do research, they can find out about it. And what's go I think what's going on here, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking, okay, why would the ancestor care that you're his descendant? And I've got it. And it's because living in the hot springs and the energy from the hot springs, that can't be good for a rotten body. Okay? It's got to deteriorate over time. Okay? As he boils away. Now, he might have magical resistance so he doesn't boil away very fast, but it's got to happen. And what I'm thinking is that just like in uh, the case of Charles Dexter Ward, he needs a descendant to transfer into. And so, the clan who worships and serves him, who are not his ancestors, because the ancestors moved to America, and he gradually used up his descendants in, Scotland, in, in Iceland, or they forgot they were descendants because their last name doesn't hide Vixen anymore, because every generation it changes. So they're having, we're having a special family reunion for the Heidvigs at the Heidvig Hot Springs. All the Heidvigs things come. And so, and so the clan is coming, and it includes cousins and stuff that aren't named Heidvigsen. So one of your players is there. If you have any players that are related, they can go to. Everyone's invited. And what the answer is, the purpose of this is because he's going to bring in all the descendants, and then one of them gets to be him. Yes. It would make it especially horrific if it's not an adult, but maybe like a child of the parents, like a young child, like, you know, six, seven, eight, like a younger person that they might go to size and take a little Well, it could be, but, but PCs rarely have kids yeah. to carry along. And if, and if you throw a kid into it to be menaced, it, in a movie it works, in a, at least if it's an Italian movie. Because in an Italian movie, kids can get killed. Okay, in an American movie, you know the kid's safe. You know the dog's safe. They might get the cat, right? But, uh, <laughs> but in an American movie, that's one reason I like, I like foreign movies so often, because in an Italian movie, there's a kid, and the kid's menace, that's an actual menace. The kid could die. In an American movie, you know it's fake. It's like, come on, go to the next scene. Okay, but, uh, so a kid is, is a great thing to menace, except a PC is not going to be the kid. They're not going to have kids. And if you throw in a kid to be menaced, they're going to know it's fake. Okay. Um, you, can, you can kill a whole bus of orphans and they will like, oh, too bad about the orphans. Which, by the way, an Italian movie does kill a whole bus of, bunch, a whole bus of little orphans. It's, it's pretty fabulous. There's, there's, a, there's a movie called um, Cemetery Man. Anyone seen it? Okay, so in Cemetery Man, there's this guy who works in the cemetery. And I, we're going to wander aside. That's how I work in my head. And I'll come up with something. And, and every night, the dead rise from their grave after they're buried. And he has to go shoot them in the head and put them back on again. And he doesn't know if it's happening everywhere. It's just there, but he just that's one of his chores, okay? And so one day, a busload of nuns and Boy Scouts gets in a crash, and they all die. And so he has to shoot all these nuns and Boy Scouts, and it just and then he goes insane, right? Because it's like too much. But uh, it's uh, recommended highly. Um, uh, it's really weird, and it, and it was filmed just before Italian horror cinema collapsed in the late nineties. So I'm not familiar with the burning the rabbit. So how does that? Happen? There's a story called. We haven't got to that point yet. Okay. But there's a story called the Velveteen Rabbit, where this kid has this toy rabbit that he loves, and actually the story is told from the rabbit's point of view. It's like, 
right? And then the kid gets really sick with scarlet fever, and he recovers, and then they have to burn the rabbit because it's full of scarlet fever germs, right? And so that's the end of the story, except then there's like an aftermath, but you can read the story, right? But the point is that they destroyed the beloved thing to save the kid, okay? So <clears throat> we will get to that point at some stage in this, and here's the other thing about doing my scenario. If we don't get to that point, if we can't fit it in, or can't fit one of the other things in, it's, we aren't trying to do a rigid structure that we must only do these things, Okay, just if we can, we're going to. It's, it's, a, it's, a, something to, it's something to springboard off and have ideas about. Okay, so what I got so far is the ancestors bringing all the descendants in so we can pick one to take over. Okay, so we got probably at least two PCs we can tie into the family. Okay, to make them all going to well, it's hard to make, they're all going to it. But, but, we, but it's hard to make them all related, usually, because the PCs are like, yeah, they have different background materials. But you can, for sure, one of them can be related, and you can probably figure out some way for one of the other ones to be a second cousin or something. So you can probably get, maybe you can get more. Okay, but the more you can get, the better. The other ones are just there to go have fun at the hot springs. Okay, so, so the monster can just kill those without a problem. And also you can have other people coming, both, both um, uh, descendants and non-descendants that are also more people to be killed. Uh, you know, because you got to have that body count, okay? And so the ancestors are going to pick one of the one of the descendants. And say, this is the guy I'm going to be. Now, the ancestor has an issue. He's the plot, the idea here is that he's he's fed off all of the descendants that he can find in Iceland, okay? And I don't know how often he has to have one. We can think about that every year, every five years, every seven years. Just when the body falls apart, could be different for different things. Um, so. So he's waiting for. I would have it. I have. I would have the ancestor be a kid just to throw the kid thing in that he mentioned. Except that then it will look like Jason at the end of Friday the Thirteenth coming out of the water, and like people will say, "Oh, it's, it's Jason." But so I don't want to have that. So because he's coming out of the water, so he's gonna he's gonna uh, want to get a person. So the thing is, he's probably gonna want to have this anniversary every year or every few years and and pick off another guy if this works. So he doesn't want to have it obvious he's killing people. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. You have the players come to the uh, the, the, the event. Okay, they're all at the event, and everyone gets the hide the thing, the velveteen rabbit, a special trophy, and this trophy has something of the ancestor I'm thinking like a finger or a toe or a, or a piece of his intestines inside of it sewed in so that he has a connection to that so that he can keep tabs on you and make sure you come back next year and all that kind of stuff so everyone gets their special thing that's really cool and it's going to be valuable in some way so who has an active campaign hopefully most of you do uh, no one has an active campaign no okay okay so um, so what's something that your players that, that a person would never throw away or sell. A ring. Right. Like a, it's like a ring. Like it a could be a ring. Heirloom. It could be a, what? Heirloom. Heirloom. What kind of heirloom would be super valuable that they just love? Lockets. Scrimshaw. Pardon? Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw. That way they have the scrimshaw thing, because then they take it. A scrimshaw you don't carry around and lose and get robbed. You put it in your house and it stays there forever. You all know what scrimshaw is? Anyone not know what scrimshaw is? Okay, so scrimshaw, so back when, they, when people whaled and would kill whales, um, which was not actually a bad thing then because there's like plenty of whales, and they're killing sperm whales, which no one thinks are sentient. Um, and so what they would do, they would take a tooth of the whale, and so you get this, this big hunk of ivory about this big. And then, I mean, you're a whaler, right? So you're on this boat for nine months of the year, and your wife's not there, and your kid's not there, and it's, you're trying to have a bunch of hammerheads that only want to talk about, the, about booze. And so it's boring. So you take your sailor's knife, and you carve things into the tooth to make it cool. So, they make, so that's what scrimshaw is. It's a, it's a tooth, a, whale, a sperm whale tooth carved with cool stuff. Okay? And that is a fabulous place to hide your relic. You just hollow it out, plug it, and your relic's inside the tooth, they're valuable. I mean, they're hundreds of dollars now. Okay, someone can, can Google uh, the, the eBay and look for a scrimshaw hunk, but they're really expensive. Okay, and so, and there's something that the Icelanders, who I don't know if they still whale, I know the Norwegians are trying to, but, the, but the, that they would have, uh, 
uh, that, they, that they would have as a cool thing. He said, here are teeth from our ancestor. And it's our ancestor. Let's give their ancestor a name. Um, last name's Heidvig. No, first name's Heidvig, because this is his clan. Heidvig might even be a girl's name, so we won't stick with Heidvig necessarily, okay? Um, and his last name doesn't matter. Um, what's, what's a good Icelandic last name? I know. Peterson. <laughs> okay? Peterson's actually Danish, but it works for Icelandic too. So Heidvig Peterson. Um, you can change the name for your own purposes. So, so Heidvig Peterson, of course, Heidvig Peterson was a whaler. Okay? He traveled the seas. He sailed to the, to the Pacific. He met the Kanakas who worshipped the great old ones, who were the same guys that Marsh contacted when he founded Innsmouth. Okay? Maybe he was on Marsh's crew. So, he, so Heidvig sails, he sails back to, to, to where Marsh is. Marsh sets up the Innsmouth cult, the Esoteric Order of Dagon. And then Heidvig sails home to Iceland, and tragically, like, there's not a Yahat and Flay off the coast. Or he lives too far inland, or the people in his town are too sucky or too few to interest the deep ones, so he can't start a deep one clan. He has to just talk to one lonely deep one and say, What do I do? And the deep one says, Well, I got away, you can stay alive forever. Okay, and he goes, I'll take it. And of course, he has to sacrifice stuff to him, maybe his whole family. Maybe that's why it's so hard to find ancestors. He's killed his kids, right? So he is now in the hot springs, and this is probably not the original Hydevig's body. But it's transferred under multiple times. He's gone through the thing. Okay. Now, if you remember in um, the case of Charles Dexter Ward, there is no soul transference at all. Okay. It's very materialistic. There is just the summoning thing. But this has some of my soul transference. But that's okay because Lovecraft has that too. As you've, if you've read the thing on the doorstep, um, there's absolutely soul transfer going on. What do you mean when you say it's, it's only physical, it's not soul transference? You mean you know, it, the piece of Charles Dexter Ward has no soul transference. Okay. Have you read it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no soul transfer. So it's just the ancestor comes back physically. He takes the place of of, of war, oh, but he's yeah. just the guy, right? Gotcha. But 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 also, but we also know from the thing on the doorstep that to do the transfer, there has to be an emotional connection to do it. You can't just take over a random person, and that means. He's got to bring everyone to the clan. He's got to have the reunion. Everyone celebrate good old Heidvig the Whaler, who's given them all a scrimshaw. And those were the days, and they're unifying and feeling camaraderie and goodness. And then they get enough of a connection. And he might be better at doing the transference than asking that weight was, because he's like a centuries old undead. But he's got to have that connection. That's why we have the meeting. And it's, and it's a scrimshaw. Another advantage of scrimshaw is it's hard to burn. You can destroy it, but it's tough. So that's good because we don't want our, our, our horrible artifact to be easy to destroy. Okay? Or something they'll even think of. It's in their, when they get, I mean, look, if you were to a family reunion in Iceland, okay, and they said, look at this awesome scrimshaw thing in this little wooden case, you'd say, wow, that's great. And you'd put it in your suitcase, and you wouldn't look at it again until you got back to uh, Indianapolis or wherever you live. Right? That's what that, you would do with it. I mean, I was given things, like, I got an awesome Peterson Games cookie cutter from a guy that 3D printed it out. So it's a, it's a Peterson Games logo, and I can make cookies out of it. Um, and I'm pretty sure that all Peterson Games cookies have to have raisins in them. But, uh, no. <laughs> but just like yellow sign cookies, which, by the way, any of you guys have the bling pack for Cthulhu Wars with the yellow sign uh, uh, plastic counters? The demonstration markers? You can use them to emboss in the middle of your cookies you have a yellow sign cookie. they got to be lemon yeah. cookies. Right. Um, I don't know if the king and yellow likes raisins or not, but uh, but there's something in those cookies. So uh, uh, yellow. Oh yeah, yeah, golden raisins. Like um, what do they call them in England? Uh, currants. Which is weird because the currants, the golden currants you get in English cooking, are actually not the currant berry. They're actually raisins that they call currants, but they do have currants that are actual currants that like the black currant juice. I mean, well, I, I won't defend English cooking here, but. Um, <laughs> That'd be a, 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 anyway. I don't want to defend it, but uh, so Heidvig is getting you here. He's giving you the scrimshaw early on. First thing that happens, 
Okay, because that way the players will forget about it. Okay, and later on when, when they start doing things, it'll be a while to figure out there's some connection. What is it? So he's got them all there. They're all loving hide the kids party. And here's the here's the great thing about this party. You can kind of skim through it. The players are going to they're going to expect all hell to break loose at the party, right? Because something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen, and nothing happens at the party. Okay, <laughs> because what's happening is that Heidvig is selecting his target. Okay, the person he wants to be his replacement. And lo and behold, it's one of the player characters. Okay? So, what happens is all the other people leave and the player characters stay behind. Their flight was delayed. Okay? Because the clan who is actually not the, they're getting power from Heidvig and rewards from Heidvig. They're probably insane and quirky and twitchy, but they're not actually Heidvig's descendants. So they, but there's enough of them, they're able to set up to delay the plane or do something to damage the plane. Maybe one of the guys goes on the plane and takes a dump in the main <laughs> hall, okay? I mean, th think about it. It'd be easy to delay a plane, right? So, so the players are delayed and says, oh, you're going to have to stay another day. Um, oh, we, hey, we'll, we'll, we got your rooms left for you. So they're, so they're now at the place one more day, and now is when the stuff happens. Now is when uh, Heidvig is going to make his move on one of the PCs. Now, what I suggest at, at this point is that you haven't decided. Heidvig decided which PC it is, but you don't have to. Okay? So at this point, you're going to have the creepy stuff. Now, the creepy stuff rule. Okay? Let's do the creepy stuff rule. The rule of danger. Now, <clears throat> What you don't want to do is say, um, you open the door and there's a Shoggoth, and then the players all get killed. <laughs> if you've seen the stats for Shoggoths in every game system that has them, like, you, like it's all over, right? So what you do is, there's three, you give them three chances to survive the, the monster, okay? If it's a killer death monster. I mean, if it's a cultist with a chainsaw, I mean, I guess you, you don't need three chances. But that's kind of a cool idea. We have to have a guy with a chainsaw in this. Um, so the first chance is you give them a hint. Okay? In the case of the Shoggoth, you say, um, man, there's a lot of crappy uh, of muck and goop and a, and a weird uh, reptile house smell around the sewer entrance. So they know something's up. Okay? Um, I'm giving the Shoggoth example that we're going to hide things. Then the players say, we're not afraid, we're going in, okay? Then you give them something more clearly dangerous. You say, um, you say, uh, oh, you find the sewer worker's body. His head's been sucked off and he's covered with slime. And this is like, now they know something is bad. They have a very good chance of knowing what, it doesn't matter what, anything that sucks the guy's heads off has got to be a problem. Okay? It doesn't matter what it is, okay? So then, then you have the solid evidence thing. And at this point, the players can still say, hmm, let's go forward or not, okay? And the third thing is the monster, which admittedly there's a chance they can drive off. Maybe not a great one for a shot off, but at that point they say, we're going to go on further. And you say, okay, emerging from the giant nexus of all the sewer things is that giant protoplasmic blob, black, covered with eyes and organs, constantly spawning. And then the players go, oh yeah, those. And then, you know... But at this point, any player that's killed can't blame you. You gave them three warnings. You know? And, and the important part, now, because I worked in video games for 22 years, one of the things I learned was that what you want to do is you want to always have the players blame themselves when they get killed. They don't blame the crappy jump that they missed the pixel because you were a terrible designer. They say, oh man, I almost made it. Because that makes them want to keep playing your game. And so even in Call of Cthulhu, the rule is the players should feel like it's their own fault. And you say, hey, no one made you go further into the sewers after you found the sucked off head. Okay? And they will say, but we had to. And you say, well, you did, yes. I mean, of course you can kind of pour and swallow them into it. And if they weren't willing to get their heads sucked off by a shotgun, why would they play Call of Cthulhu, right? <laughs> um, so in our case, what I'm suggesting is that the first thing is that we have the boiled hot springs corpse of Heidvig. Um... Uh, come sneaking by the rooms at night where they can smell him like cooked rotten meat 
okay? Or, or, or he leaves something in the halls. But also at this point he says, hey, because we left the other guys, we can open up the deeper part of the hot springs where they're better, there's more sulfur, so it's healthier for you. Because for some reason they thought the stinkier the hot spring, the healthier, right? Or, and of course that's, now we're getting down where hydrogen gets. So the idea is you have layers, like here is the, the surface of the building that you're in. That's not a building, it's a mountain. But here's the, there's the, 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 the spa resort. Okay, and then um, and of course I'm sure that Hyde occasionally picks off a guy at the spa resort, but he can't replace them. He can just like eat them because you know he is an undead monster, right? Um, or the cultists because they're insane killers might kill one just like because that's what they do. Okay, so then under so then under here, here's the main hot spring baths, but then there's like stairs going down, and there's more hot spring baths down here. That's the one that it takes you to, and of course one more layer is enough. We don't need more than that. And this down here is the big H. That's his special bath. So the players have gone to here, and the idea is that they will get a clue if they have any brains. Do any goons players have any brains? <laughs> um, mine sometimes do. That maybe if there's two layers, and they didn't know about this layer, there might be a third. Okay, and the third, when they go there, that's when the confrontation happens. Okay? And, uh, and in fact, I'm thinking that the third one, it's the hot springs, we have the whole burning thing. I'm thinking that's where the pool of lava is. And that's and and why not have to throw the scrimshaw in there? It's just like Frodo and Mount Doom. You got to take your. So what you have to do is get the is is the plan to win the game. Now, if, now one of my rules: if the players come up with a different plan that seems like it would work, I'm okay with that. I don't. I'm like hard. I'm not hard nosed about it. Must be the way I thought of. But my plan, I'm thinking in my head is: hey, if they throw the scrimshaw into the lava pit, then that will t take the connecting thing to the source of power, and that will break the emotional tie with Heidvig. And it can't possess them anymore. Of course, he can still kill them, because he's an undead monster. But, but at least they won't have to be Heidvig, right? Um, but the other plan I have in the back of my head is, you know what, let's say worse comes to worse, and Heidvig takes over one of the PCs, and he becomes the new undead horror in the hot springs. That's okay by me. The remaining players, if they survive, have this awesome jack-in-the-box in the hot springs, waiting for him. That's the former friend. How cool is that? You know, that's a great result. So one of the, my rules in general is that, I, is that I need to be okay with the players failing. And once you're okay with the players failing, then a lot of things open up. And you have new things in that. They hold new scenario. So let's go to the scenario. So Hydevig is going to um, sneak by the rooms. We have two hints, actually. We have evidence of him in the halls. And, uh, and when they talk about it, say, hey, why is there bits of, like, is that skin? Is that a tooth? What's going on here? And, and the, uh, the clan goes, oh, sorry, we didn't clean up this morning yet. And that's all they say, right? And you're like, didn't clean up? Now, one of the issues that players have, one of the problems you're going to have as a game master is that in a movie or in a book, the characters will start to question someone or talk to them. And then um, uh, the, like, the person will blow, blow them off or go away or say we're done here and, and, you can't, and, and the scene goes on you can't, so you only get like interesting cool hints but in the game those hammerheads will drill in on that guy what about this and what about this and what about this and you don't want them to tell them all those things so you have to have a way for the workers to blow them off okay? and they have that way because they're workers in the thing they all got pagers they're, my pager went off sorry we'll have to talk later and they just book out of there if you don't want them to answer their question and they just flat out leave. Okay, you've got the the pager. You have you have possible other things. Clean up on aisle six. You know, and probably I sorry. I got to set up the kitchen. So the so the point is, you're trying to keep the players from from sitting down with one of the clan members and go with them because the clan members may not be that smart. Okay, but they can give them hints. That you know when they when a, a clan member might say something like, well, you know, the one who's below. And they go, what? One? No, I mean, I mean, my, 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 above me, my boss. He's above me, not below. And they're like, and the players get a hint, but they go, I want to go more. And it says, no, oh, sorry, I got, a, I got my pager going off, right? And so that way you get them hints about the one who's below. In fact, I like that phrase. We'll do one who's below. Another thing you can do is because I guarantee none of your players have Icelandic on their character sheets is you can have the guy suddenly not understand English. Okay? And if the players try to research into this, you can let them find out that... that so, the, so the U.S. government rates all languages into four categories of ease of learning for English speakers. The, the, our, the diplomacy department does it. My 
my uh, uh, nephew works for them, so I know this. And so the, uh, there's the easiest languages that are super simple, like English, and this is Dutch, and French, and Spanish, and Italian, and oddly enough, Romanian, and Norwegian, and Icelandic. These are all really English, easy for English speakers to learn. And it's based on similarity of vocabulary, similarity of grammar, and similarity of culture. So the second, so category two, second hardest, is German, all by itself. <laughs> it's like, okay? And then category three is harder, it's like Malaysian and stuff. And category four are the, are the ones that are hard to learn. Things like Chinese, uh, Mandarin Chinese, and Japanese, and Korean. But you can look it up. So if they look it up, they'll see, oh, Icelandic is like in the easiest category. Why can't end your Sammy? It's a it's a spa resort. Why would I hire someone? And, but that could be one of the clues that that, that there was the guys who obviously would have to speak English if they're at a resort in Iceland, okay? Because the Iceland guys aren't going to go to a to a hot springs resort in Iceland. They have their own hot springs they go to, right? Um, and he doesn't speak English, so that could be another clue for him. So you got a couple clues going on here. One who's below the thing, and they start looking it up. They start looking up history of the clan to find out, huh? Heidvig sailed with Captain Marsh. Back in the day, that's interesting. And 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 what's going to happen here is the players are probably going to know what that means. If their characters don't, then what you're going to have to get them to do is to have look up some of the history of Captain Marsh and Innsmouth, and so the players will know it, right? The characters will know it, right? So that'll give them a connection. That's something bad about Heidegg, and uh, and that's that's going to be good. How are you on time here? Are you doing great on time? We're doing fabulous on time. So, the evidence is the underground chamber, okay, the zeroing in, the, the, the morning that they get up, and uh, uh, what's one of your players' names? Uh, Dudley. Dudley. So Dudley, so everyone says, hey, Dudley isn't here to breakfast. And, and, and he's not there because Dudley has been, dra been dragged down for the ceremony. Because it's not a trivial thing to take over someone's body and soul. And so at this point, they realize, and Dudley, the player, is sitting there saying, what the heck? Where am I? And you're like, well, you're not here. No one knows. So then the players are going to say, this is the action scene. Got to save Dudley. And they're going to go down here, and no one's there. And if, you, if, like, if they're really numb nuts, you need a hint, you can have a door open that leads down below. And they run down below, and there's the clan arranged in a big seven-pointed star, chanting with the undead horror rising from the thing and moving forward onto the platform where Dudley's chained. And suddenly you have an awesome scene with an undead monster and the lava pit bubbling. Okay? And I guarantee someone's going into that lava pit. Okay? <laughs> a, a, a PC wrestling with a cultist or one of the cultists, it doesn't matter. That lava pit's got, you know... It's like, it's like I, uh, there's a movie mine called The Hunchback of the Morgue. And one of the first things you find out is that in the basement of this guy's place, there's an acid bath. I'm like, huh, an acid bath, that's going to get used. So it's Chekhov's acid bath, if you know the reference. Okay? And of course, it's used in the first five minutes. And then I'm like, yeah, you got used. And then it's used like 20 more times. So I was like, it was the best acid bath ever. Um, <clears throat> so you got, that, you got the lava pit. This is Chekhov's lava pit, going to get used. People are going to throw into it. You can have a fight down there. They can realize that they can't thwart it because they don't have the scrimshaw, if, right? It, it, the connecting item. Maybe they run back upstairs. Of course, shooting up the, the monster isn't going to do anything because he's fallen apart anyway, right? Maybe part of the ritual is to destroy his body so his spirit can, can, can be freed of it and move in. And he wants... Oh, that would be fabulous. That's the bell here. He wants you to destroy him. He's trying to get to the lava pit to fully destroy his body so his spirit can take over Hyde, to take over the Dudley. How cool is that? Okay, because in the Velveteen Rabbit, that's what happens. They burn the rabbit and it frees the spirit. He's so your players are trying to stop the monster from being destroyed. Oh my god, okay, this, this is gonna work for me. Okay. Got the Velveteen Rabbit, got the Hot Springs, got the Undead Nations, got the Clan. I recommend not too many cultists in town. Maybe the other ones are out crapping on, on, air, on, um, on airline seats to keep them from flying away. <laughs> or, 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 or literally murdering taxi cab drivers so they can't get there to take you away. Mm. Okay? I love the idea of finding the taxi cab when they're walking through the woods. That taxi never showed up. And the taxi is there with the dead driver. Like, wait a second. <laughs> okay? Because this is, remember, after the party. So, so they're killing him. They got the undead monster in the basement. He's trying to get to the lava. 
Okay, and you've got to throw, you've got to keep them from going there, but you have to also throw the screenshot in, which they got to figure out. And hopefully, they won't figure it out until after they're down here battling. So someone's got to go all the way back upstairs, go through the luggage, get the scrimshaw, run back down and throw it in while they're holding them off. And meanwhile, some of the, the guys, the clan guys in the basement, one of the, so. But here's something I got to put up briefly. One of the one of the tropes in modern movies that I think is stupid is that they always try to put you in a place where you can't get your cell phone. Okay, because the, the new makers can't figure out a way to make the cell phones a threat or a problem. They go, ooh, how can we get them away from the cell phone so that the monsters, they can't just call for help? Well, now, Return of the Living Dead did a great job because they called for help, and then the zombies just, like, send more cops. You know, they're cool with the help coming, okay? So, so uh, and, and uh, the movie... Um, uh, 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 Juan did a great job because they like they get on the phone and it's like the ghost is on the phone, so you don't you really don't you want to get your phone away from you, okay? So in this case, we're going to use those phones, okay? They run upstairs to get the scrimshaw. Cold us in the basement. Say, hey, Hertha, there's a guy running upstairs to get the scrimshaw. Go stop him. They have phones, right? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, if you call the cops, okay, I've seen Icelandic cops in action. And the way, reason I've seen them is because one of the very first playthroughs of Cthulhu Wars was in a friend of mine who lives in Iceland, um, uh, married to Heidvig daughter. And, uh, and they're playing it in their garage. And I saw, and they have video, I watched the video of them playing the game. And the cops show up because the neighbors thought there was a drug deal or something going down. Because uh, they're locking, they're playing Cthulhu Wars. And so the cops come in and they're super polite and nice. And really neat. So if the cops are going to come, these guys, they could call the cops and say, well, one of the guests is kind of drunk, but don't worry. We got this. Or if you really want to, just put one of the cultists, at, have one of your cultists be the, they're probably too crazy to be an actual cop, but they could be the dispatcher, the guy that takes the calls. And say, oh yeah, I'll run on that. <laughs> okay? Whatever, 911, right? Seriously, right? And, and to make it even better, when they call, have them recognize the voice. We go, oh my gosh, it's Hertha. She's working for the cops. I can't get help. Okay, so that's what I do. It. So we have the big, we have the big confrontation. They're trying to get the scrimmage right in there, trying to keep the monster from killing itself. The, the other guys are fighting to kill the monster so he can jump into the lava. Dudley's screaming and rattling around in the chains, trying to get away. And of course, even if Dudley does get away and they break the chains, it doesn't matter where he is if the monster's body has been destroyed because a spiritual force can go anywhere and take him over. So, so uh, one, of the, one of the awesome things might be is you're on the plane going home. You broke up the out, ran away, didn't destroy the scrimshaw. The monster gets destroyed. And on the plane on the way home, way home that's when he's taken over. You know? And, of course, as soon as it takes you over, your heart stops because you've got to be dead to be high big. All right? And then when they land, he's like, I must now go back to Iceland. Anyway, you can... You can you're on your own for that part of it, okay? So here we have a scenario, which I think is strong, fun. It could be one or two nights, okay? And it has an action scene at the end, which I like, but it's a horror action scene. And it's got some twists where you're trying to, to not destroy the monster. You got the hot springs, you got lava, you got cultists, you have, uh, and you have a network of people that you met at the reunion that are now tools to pull players into future scenarios, okay? And uh, I think we I think we had a strong story, and we use all the parts, and that is how Sandy Peterson does a horror scenario. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Are there any types of tropes in, in movies or books that you know that are in horror that just don't tend to play well in game scenarios? Like you mentioned, like the kind of the kid doesn't work well in game scenarios. Um, uh, 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 there, there's uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, one of the one of the tropes that one of the things that Hollywood does that I really hate in horror movies, and it's because they do it in all our movies, is a three act structure, which they actually teach in school. You know, where, where and, and it's just by the numbers where you know in the second act, okay, okay, it's time for the drugs to get beaten up, it's time for this, and it's like, it's like, it's so tired. And one of the reasons I watch a lot of foreign movies or older movies is because they don't, they aren't rigidly locked into that three-act structure yet, you know? Um, of course, it can work in a, in a game, I guess. Um, one of the things that, I, that, I, that uh, I, I try to avoid a lot is one of the ways, people are always looking for ways to get guys into Call of Duty. The, biggest, the big challenge in writing a Call of Duty scenario is how do you get the players involved? 
Okay, and it could be they randomly stop this truck stop and it's inhabited by zombies, okay, or ghouls or something, uh, and that will work. But it seems kind of like, man, that was sure coincidental. Or, 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 but the most common thing is Uncle Nick calls you up and says, "I have this haunted house you have to investigate. Come check it out." And Uncle Nick is a goner usually in those things. This is cool because you have the relative thing, and then it's it's kind of turned on its head a little bit. They don't ever they don't meet Heidig till the end. And then the clan isn't their relatives, and then there's all this stuff going on with that I think is, is effective. Um, little kids don't work. Um, a psychological horror doesn't really work, I don't think. Um, where you're, but, but, you, how, how many, but you're probably not going to try to play the black swan in your scenario, right? So I think you're good. I, I, like, I like it more to be more physical, non-psychological, uh, direct horror. Um, you can't rely on the player. One of the things, the players are a bunch of unreliable goofballs, so you can't rely on them to react a certain way. <clears throat> so sometimes, while you, I like to give them as much choice as possible, it's okay to say, Dudley isn't here this morning, and have him figure out why. And the Dudley, Dudley has lost his freedom of choice, but it won't be for long once they figure out where it is. And, uh, and heck, they could, they could call Dudley on his phone, which he's got in his pocket, chained to the thing, right? And then they can hear people screaming, they go, or doubly screaming, you know, people are chanting, they go, whoa, that sounds like it's echoing, must be in the basement. So. The no jargon rule, like, what specifically, like, jargon in Lovecraft are you talking about? It's like Lovecraft doesn't have jargon. What I'm talking about when I say no jargon rule in this is, the, is actually the Call of Cthulhu rules. Where, where, for example, when Heidvig Ryle rises from the deep, instead of oh, saying, say you have to make a sanity roll because Heidvig's alive, but you say, you say that, uh, uh, a colossal undead horror emerges, dripping, his skin's been boiled off him, his eyes are, are, per- are white, boiled uh, uh, balls, and, and, he, and he steps forward with, with, with the flesh dripping from him in strips, and, and, uh, and uh, if your players have any sense, they'll start asking if they should make sanity rolls, and of course they should, but if they don't, then you can say, and you must make a sanity roll. You know, and so the emphasis on, is on the horror, That's not right. sanity roll. Right, right, exactly. You know, like like one of the things is it, like when they roll into the lava pit, you don't have to roll for damage, right? It's like, dudes, you're in the lava pit. <laughs> like, we don't roll damage for that. If they insist on a damage roll, tell them that according to the official Call of Cthulhu rules, molten rock is fourteen hundred degrees, and that means there's fourteen dice of damage they take each round. So if they have fifteen or more hit points and they roll fourteen, they might survive. But my guess is they will say, "Got him." But they should know, right? They should know that lava pit's going to kill them. Okay, um, and the lava pit's cool. And if you want to show them the lava pit earlier, you can. But I mean, that is where Heidvig is, so maybe you don't want to. So there it is. Any other scenarios? Any other questions? I mean, okay, this was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. Uh, and the worst cases, you now have a cool scenario to run in your game. Uh, I hope none of your players are here listening in and, and getting all the. Uh, <laughs> the spoilers, <laughs> and I'll see you guys around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.